Hi, and welcome to our webinar, Bringing the Magic of Learning to Puerto Rico. I'm Nick Early, the Executive Center Director for Lindemood Bell, Miami. Hola, yo soy Nicole Machete, la Directora Asociada de Lindemood Bell, Miami. Gracias por reunir con nosotros para ver nuestro webinar. Vamos a traer la magia de aprendizaje a Puerto Rico. Quédese con nosotros para aprender más información de nuestra evaluación, instrucción y qué tipos de estudiantes nosotros pudieran beneficiar. Over the past eight years, Nicole and I have experienced the many sacrifices that families make to uproot their entire lives and move to a brand new city, state, or country to receive specialized instruction at Lindemoot Bell. It's because of these experiences that we've decided to bring the magic of learning to Puerto Rico this April. If you stay tuned, Kendall Smith, one of our regional directors, is going to tell you more about our philosophy, our instruction, and the evaluations that we provide for students. Durante la webinar, vamos a estar contestando preguntas que tengan via chat. Por favor, quédense con nosotros después, que vamos a hablar más cómo nosotros podemos llegar a Puerto Rico. We'll be available in English and Spanish for chat during the entire webinar, so feel free to ask questions. At the end of the webinar, Nicole and I will be back for a message to tell you more about what you can do to help bring the magic of learning to Puerto Rico. Here's Kendall. Hello everyone, I think I was asked to present today because I have a variety of, of experiences teaching one-on-one, -on -one, um, training teachers in our programs in, uh, in schools and small classrooms, working with small groups of students, as well as being a center director. And I've got two goals for us today as we meet together. One of them is to be able to help you better understand what you might be seeing with your son or daughter at home, or what you might be seeing with the students that you work with either in a school or in a private practice, because um, I know we have a variety of folks attending for a number of different reasons. The second goal is to be able to offer some solutions for you and to help you see how Linda Mood Bell might be a great solution uh, either for, again, son or daughter or the students that you work with. Um, so let me give you a picture and a little bit of context of who we are as an organization. If you're not familiar with Linda Mood Bell, I know a lot of you are. Um, we, I'm here in San Luis Obispo in our, in our home office, and we have located here our first learning center that we began with back in 1986. And we now have 48 locations in the U.S., so since 1986 we've had quite a bit of growth, and we're happy to be um, you know, along both coasts and all over the middle. We have one location in um, London, and we also have a Sydney, Australia location. And where you see there, it says 40 plus silks. A silk is a seasonal intensive learning center, and what that means is we um, have families and, and professionals that are interested in having us come to their community, even though we don't have a center there. And so we will come and kind of um, set up a center in a temporary location and be there for a period of time so that we can serve that community. And right now, we actually have two locations happening, one in Wyoming and one in Martha's Vineyard. Um, and then, you know, summertime, we have quite a bit more, which is where you see that number of 40 plus. Um, something else that Linda Mood Bell does as an organization is we do workshops and conferences. So we train 5,000 teachers a year, and we have our international conference every other year. And there's quite a buzz here in San Luis Obispo as we get ready to have our international conference next week. It begins on Thursday down in Anaheim, California. Um, we also have school partnerships. So we actually work in over 100 schools, um, and we're internationally recognized for the work that we do, not just with students in those schools, but teachers as well. And we often see schools that are underperforming uh, rise to kind of a higher level than anyone might have expected, and it's, it's really thrilling to see students um, hit a new level of achievement that, that neither you know, them or as individuals or as a school they've, they've seen before. So it's really, really exciting for all of us. I want to give you a sense of who uh, Linda Mood and Bell are. Um, as you might imagine, um, sometimes people are curious about our name. Nancy Bell is in that top picture, and she's our director and CEO and one of our founders. And she co-founded Linda Mood Bell uh, with Patricia Linda Mood again back in 1986. And Patricia Linda Mood is the woman in the front of the picture of the three ladies in the bottom um, right-hand corner. And um, Pat was a speech and language pathologist, Nancy was a classroom teacher and a reading specialist, and together they saw a great need and some really great answers to questions that people were having about their students, and so that's why they formed the organization uh, back in the 80s. Just this year, Nancy received the 2013 Distinguished Leader in Special Education Award and flew to the East Coast to receive that. 
Um, again, this year we're hosting our 18th international conference next week down in Anaheim. And uh, one of the questions we get quite a bit is, are you franchised? So our center directors who talk with parents are often asked, is, is this center a franchise? And we are not. Um, all 50 centers are owned, operated, and overseen in terms of the quality by our founders. And I think that's something that makes us unique because the instruction that you get in a center here in California will be the same instruction you get in a center on the East Coast. And in fact, we've had students that have gone to multiple centers during the course of their instruction. So I want us to ask some questions today. And where this says our questions, this is not just our questions as Linda Mood Bell, now that you have a little bit better picture who we are. This is our questions as parents, as educators, that we really need to be mindful of in terms of what we're seeing with our students. And so the first question we need to ask is, why do some children succeed in school and others don't? You know, what is that? Um, sometimes it's attributed, you know, to effort, but, but we believe there's something else. What are the sensory cognitive factors preventing children from learning to read, spell, and comprehend to their potential? We're going to talk about what sensory cognitive factors are in just a minute. And can these sensory cognitive factors not only be identified, right, because if you can, if you can see it and know what it is, that's helpful, but can they also be stimulated or developed and then applied to schoolwork? Is it something that we have to modify the environment for, or is it something that can actually be developed for our students and then help them apply it to their everyday interactions like school, schoolwork and um, things that come up at home? So let's talk about sensory cognitive functions. By sensory, we mean things that we perceive at our sensory level. So, you know, uh, sight, um, hearing, uh, touch. Um, and then cognitive being, of course, how our brain takes that information and processes it, processes it and what it does with it. And we believe that there's three things that contribute to language and learning uh, for our students. The first is phonemic awareness. And you may have heard this term before, um, especially as students are entering first and second grade. This is their ability to auditorily perceive the identity, number, and sequence of sounds within words. So to break that definition down for you, if I said the word FIP, if someone with good phonemic awareness would be able to process or hear that there's three different sounds in that word sip, and they might be able to tell me that the I is the second sound, the P is the last sound, etc. Students with difficult or weak phonemic awareness might only hear that as one sound, and really it's a syllable with three sounds. Symbol imagery is the ability to auditorily perceive the sounds as well as visually image the sounds and the letters within words. And if you were all in the room with me, I would ask you, I would ask who saw letters for that word, and probably at least half of you would raise your hand. And some of you would tell me that you saw FIP when I said that word. And some of you might have even said that you saw PHIP because your symbol imagery has that pattern of PH as kind of a memorized pattern for that sound of. Concept imagery is the third skill, and it actually happens on the other side of the brain. And this is our ability to create an image gestalt or a whole from oral and written language. So to contrast this for you, if, if your symbol imagery was activated and I said the word cat, you would be picturing C-A-T. But if you're using your concept imagery and I say the word cat, you're actually visualizing an animal. And some of you might be seeing that cat in a tree, some of you might be seeing it curled up on a couch or in the sun next to the window, but nonetheless you're visualizing a cat. And that's your ability to create a picture of that that object or that thing. And when you start adding language to it that adds in you know, verbs or action or nouns, then you can actually start creating a movie. Um, so if I said the cat ran down the street after a gopher. Um, so that would allow you to picture you know, that, that movie a bit more. We wouldn't be doing our job as a research-based organization and a research-validated organization if we didn't uh, align ourselves with a theory of cognition. And so this theory is called the dual coding theory, and it talks about essentially the imagery language connection. And it was developed by Alan Pavio, who's a cognitive psychologist out of the University of Western Ontario, and he's actually one of our keynote speakers at our conference next week. He researched this theory, the DCT, as we all like to refer to it, and it's a theoretical model for cognition. Essentially, he says, Performance is mediated by the joint activity of verbal and nonverbal systems. Cognition is always an interplay between the verbal and the nonverbal systems. In other words, we take language in and we create mental representations for it. 
Pavio said that imagery includes not only static representations, and I'm going to ask you to hold on to that word because we're going to talk about it in a little bit. So imagery includes not only static representations, but also dynamic representations of action sequences and relationships between objects and events. So again, hold those two words, static and dynamic. And as you might expect, Pavio said that individuals differ in the extent, manner, and efficiency of employment of each of the systems according to their verbal and nonverbal habits and skills. And if you have one child who struggles and one child who doesn't, you can definitely tell us that individuals differ in terms of how they can employ their different skills. Or if you have a classroom full of students that you work with, you also know that individuals differ in terms of their skills. So to bring this all to a practical level, let's talk about what happens for our students when this theory of DCT um, you know, comes into play and maybe for some of our students it's not working so well. We know that weak language and literacy skills are the primary cause of failure to make a year of gain for a year of instruction. So we see a lot of students that are um, first graders and they're already a few months behind in their reading. Or we see a lot of students that are fifth graders and they're several years behind in their reading. And we think about this in terms of a pipeline. So if you look at this, you know, the, the straight line kind of going from K through 12 all the way up, that's what we would hope or expect for students that can do these skills. So they enter school at kindergarten and they kind of move along through those, those different grade levels, taking in the curriculum, being able to process it. But a student that has weak phonemic awareness, and notice that's on our, on our um, sketch of our person here, it's next to the ear, it's processing or hearing. Um, or we concept imagery and symbol imagery, they're going to have a hard time processing the information that comes their way. So by the time they're in kindergarten or first grade, they might be just a few months behind, and you'll see that bottom line is kind of starting to veer off. And by the time they're in second or third grade, their trajectory has changed. So we can predict out when they're in high school, they're going to be not just a few months behind, but multiple years behind their peers. And again, if we were all in the room together, I would ask, you know, does anyone want to venture a guess as to why we have that, that third grade level circled? Um, and you're probably thinking about that already. What we find, especially here in the States, is many of our students don't qualify for services um, until third grade. So already their processing has gotten them behind and there's a gap to make up. And that's concerning because not only will their performance be affected, but confidence and their ability to even attempt new things will be impacted. Let's talk about the reading paradigm, um, because we believe that reading is an integration of skills. We believe that reading um, doesn't happen just in one part of the brain or with one set of skills. You really have to have this kind of symphony of all your skills working together and playing at the right time. Um, and so when we think about that first skill, you know, a student that arrives on the scene um, as a first grader, their job is to learn how to read. And that starts with learning the letters and learning the sounds that they make, so they're learning their phonics. And that's part of that auditory circle, so that one that you see on the left. And once they learn the individual letters and sounds, they need to start piecing them together. So they start learning how to, how to blend words like cat or, you know, d, og. So they put sounds together that actually play fair or do what we expect them to do. And their phonemic awareness and their symbol imagery is becoming quite employed at this time um, in, this, in this part of their experience in school. And you'll see there it says word attack. Um, very much they're learning to attack or decode new words. And so for those of you with a kindergartner or a first grader, um, you know, your teacher might have talked to you about word attack or phonics and how they're doing with those things. But for any of us, once we learn how to sound out a new word, so when you finally do uh, sound out at and you know what it says, then you should just recognize it every time you read it. And so that's where our processing moves over into the visual circle. And that's where our symbol imagery takes over. And this becomes especially important for words that don't play fair. Um, so sight words. A lot of you might have first or second graders that have lists of sight words that come home that they have to learn. And no matter how many times you have them practice them, um, you know, restate them, spell them, whatever it is, you know, whatever creative thing you're doing at home to get them to learn those words, they're not hooking, they're not sticking with them. And the underlying sensory cognitive skill that will allow for those sight words to stay with them is symbol imagery. We give a measure, um, a test of symbol imagery to our students, and I always find this really interesting because what we see is that for many of our students, when we see how many letters they can hold in their mind at a time, they can only hold two or three letters. 
And so if you think, I think about it in terms of like a bicep muscle, <laughs> and which I don't have very strong ones. And so if I were to go to the gym and pick up my max of maybe 15 or 20, um, you know, that's all I can do right now. And eventually I can work up to the heavier weights or the more difficult, um, you know, weights, but it's got to take practice and it's got to take um you know, time to develop that muscle. And essentially, the symbol imagery still can be seen as a muscle, and it can be developed. So students aren't kind of um, resolved to accept what they have or stuck with what they've got. Symbol imagery can definitely be developed, and what we see on our retest is that students can actually, um, you know, hold uh, multiple, um, you know, words with, with lots and lots of letters, so seven, eight, multisyllable, seven, eight or, uh, letters and multisyllable words, which is really exciting. That final circle down at the bottom is the language circle. And this is what a lot of us employ as individual and independent readers. So we're reading along and let's say we read, um, you know, I went to the circus and I saw three elegants um, in, the, in the main ring. Well, your context would allow you to say, oh no, it's, it's elephants and you would fix it right away. And you don't even really need to take a second look at that word. You just realize that it doesn't make sense. Um, for students that are lacking in their auditory and their visual processing, though, they're relying primarily on their language skills, primarily on their use of context. And so these are our little guys that when they're reading a picture book, they're constantly checking the picture to see if what they're saying, you know, what's coming out of their mouth is even remotely matching the picture that's in front of them. And that's a really frustrating way to try to get through a story, um, especially if you're only relying on, um, on one of these three important skills. And so again, reading is an integration of these. Now the other circle that you're going to see there is that bigger fourth circle, the comprehension circle. And we have students that come to us where their auditory, their visual, and their language circles are well intact. In fact, they might even be above their age and grade level, and they're still struggling in comprehension. And so what we see on our assessments is they might be weak in things like following oral directions or reading comprehension, and there's really no kind of visible or obvious explanation for it because their vocabulary is good, um, they're reading the words beautifully and fluently, and then you say to them, what was that passage about? And they say, I, I don't know, I, a dog, I think, or something. And so, and it, it, it's not necessarily that they are not trying to pay attention or not listening, and we'll talk more about what that can look like for some of our students, because what's happening for them is they are not taking that language in and creating a movie in their mind and seeing it play out, um, again, like a film or like a movie, they're going to have a difficult time processing and understanding what that information is, whether it's a novel or it's a science text or a new math concept. So all of those things can be impacted by someone's ability to take in new language and create a mental picture for it. So we can kind of see all of these skills as a spectrum. And we're going to look at two students, Lance and Michelle, that actually were students of Nancy's and of Phyllis's years ago. Um, and we're going to look at how these two types of imagery, symbol imagery and concept imagery, uh, were either strong or weak for Lance and Michelle. So let's talk first about Lance. If you picture Lance, he was a 10th grader, he was 16 years old, and um, he was very gregarious. He was a football player, um, tall, well-liked at his school, um, jovial, you know, he could make jokes and, and really related well to people. Um, but he was ready to drop out of school. He was ready to leave high school. And if you picture him, um, he had, you know, you can see some of the things that were part of his background and his experience. He was retained. He struggled early to learn how to read. He was always in summer school. And one of the things that, that Lance recounted to us, he actually spoke at our conference a few years ago, and he said that when he was pulled out of his classroom for special services, he would um, leave his room, and as he passed the other classrooms, he would duck below the windows and try to hide so the other kids couldn't see him getting pulled out to go to resource because he didn't want to be seen as different. He didn't want to be labeled or kind of put in a box. And you can see the different types of strategies that were tried with him along the way. My other favorite story that he told is that when his mother brought him in for an assessment with us, um, they had a discussion in the parking lot, and I'm, I'm using air quotes on the word discussion because it was really more like an argument, um, because Lance was 16 and he was fed up. He did not want to go anyplace else. He had, he had been around the block in terms of, um, you know, 
interventions, um, both in school and out of school, and he was ready to just be done. He had a, a work permit, he had a work study program, and he was ready to just give up and, and leave school. I think looking at his performance is really important. What you'll see there is CA stands for chronological age, so Lance was 16 years and two months old, and his Peabody Picture Vocabulary Test, or his PPVT, was 17 years and 11 months old. And this is a good measure of minimum potential. This assessment gives us a sense for what a student will be able to understand. And Lance's potential, even though he was struggling with reading, was almost two years above his actual age and grade level. So he was functioning like an adult in this skill. His lack test, which is actually a measure, uh, a test that measures how well he's able to process the individual sounds and letters within words, both single and multisyllable, uh, was 64 out of 100, which puts him at an elementary school level. His word attack, which is his ability to sound out new words, was 2.2 grade level, and word recognition, which is his sight word, so that fits that visual circle a little bit more, was 5.1. And you might be asking yourself why a difference there, and I think part of the reason for that is that he was uh, he was he had been in school long enough to be able to acquire some sight words. Same thing with his paragraph reading. He was almost at a sixth grade level, but it was not fluent at all. It was accurate, but it was very choppy and very unenjoyable for him and laborious. Spelling, as you might imagine, was very weak. But look at his oral direction. So he took in his, word, his world verbally. He took it all in by oral directions, and that's how he got by, and that's how he was able to be so successful at his job. Lance would see a word like stream, so you can see visually he's looking at that word stream, and what he would say, what his mouth would produce, is steam. And he would also be picturing the letters for the word steam. And so you would say to him, you know, maybe in the past someone trying to work with him would say, Lance, that word says stream. And he would say, okay, steam. Because he couldn't hear that he was leaving the R out, and he also couldn't picture that he was leaving the R out. So he couldn't picture that word, S-T-E-A-M, that he had said. So he didn't have that ability to hold and compare the word that he was looking at and the word that he was actually saying. He had a weakness in phonemic awareness then and also in symbol imagery. Students that are like Lance, and, and Lance is kind of an unusual situation for us now in the sense that we often don't see students this, of this age um, that are struggling quite as much as, as Lance was. Um, we don't see it as commonly. I mean, we definitely have clients that are in that situation, so don't get me wrong. But what I've seen over my experience at Linda Mood Bell is that more and more, parents and educators are seeing this early on. And you can start to see these challenges that Lance was having very early on. Um, and in fact, when Lance got back in touch with us, it was because he wanted to bring his son and he recognized some of those challenges that he was having um, as a five-year-old. You can see this list of symptoms of weak phonemic awareness and weak symbol imagery. So it starts with a difficulty with sounding out new words. Again, that's what first and second graders and even kindergartners are expected to do. That's their job. Um, weak word recognition skills, so not having an easy time recognizing sight words, and also learning and retaining them. So I was just talking with a friend of mine, and her daughter is eight, and she was saying she'll learn the words for the spelling test uh, for that Friday, and she'll do really great, and then they're gone forever. <laughs> and so, so there's not that retention. It's just that short-term memory to get through the test on Friday. Weak phonological spelling is when the word is spelled in a way that doesn't represent all of its sounds. So you can see the example for opportunity, some of the sounds are missing. Versus weak, weak orthographic spelling, that second version of the student's attempt to spell opportunity there where it's O-P-E-R, um, that is someone who spelled it the way it sounds, but it didn't spell it correctly. And if you've ever had autocorrect on your phone try to help you out or spell check, you know, on a document try to help you out, you know that those aren't always going to give us the word that we're looking for. And so um, even getting close sometimes isn't close enough. Difficulty reading fluently in context. And then if you skip one and see where it says slow and laborious decoding skills or reading skills, these two are where I see our students have the biggest frustration because they just want to read. You know, every student I know shows up in school excited to learn how to read and excited to be able to read stories and do what their siblings are doing or their friends are doing. And when it is so slow and so difficult, they would rather just have someone else read to them. And it's not as though they don't want the stories or the information. They just don't want to do it themselves because it's so frustrating and it's so complicated. And, and oftentimes in, in our centers, I work in the Bay Area and we see a number of students where 
what they're able to read is maybe Bob books, and what they want to be reading is Harry Potter. And, and so there's a big gap between their ability and their potential, and again, that also creates frustration. And these students with weak phonemic awareness and weak symbol imagery may be labeled dyslexic, not always, um, but, but if, if a student comes to us with that label, um, that's oftentimes a clue for us that there might be some difficulties with their phonemic awareness or their symbol imagery. Or their SA and their P, or their SI and PA, just to get you all up with our, <laughs> our lingo. Um, Let's look at the other side of the spectrum. This is Michelle, and Michelle also came to us as a high schooler a number of years ago. She actually did an assessment with Phyllis. And Michelle, if you picture her, um, had curly red hair, and when she came in, it was hanging in her face, and she wouldn't make eye contact, and she was very flat affect, soft-spoken, um, didn't really engage in, in conversation much at all, very simple answers. And Michelle was a little bit older than Lance in that she was uh, 12th grade. She was 17 years and four months old, and her PPVT was 17 years and two months. And so if I were to ask you all again, if we were all in the room together, how's she doing? Most of you would probably say, hmm, she's doing pretty good. She's right on par with her age and grade level. But Michelle was dropping out of high school because she didn't have enough credits to graduate. And when they told her this, she said, what do you mean? I'm not going to graduate. I was here every day. And so she didn't have the connection between the performance on her grades and how she was doing and the fact that was she going to graduate or not. And so already there's a clue there about critical thinking skills and, um, and cause and effect. Michelle could definitely read, but she couldn't comprehend. Um, you know, students like this sometimes are labeled hyperlexic or autistic, and you'll see that kind of referenced there. Her LAC test, which is that same test that, that Lance had so much difficulty with, where he was showing us perceiving uh, letters and sounds, or sounds, I should say, Michelle aced it. She got a perfect score, and where Lance kind of tried to muddle his way through it and really struggled through it by watching the evaluator's face to see what their mouth was doing, Michelle looked down the whole time and could just perceive and hear the sounds and didn't have to watch what the evaluator's mouth was doing. So she had an extremely high ability with phonemic awareness and symbol imagery. Her word attack, her sight words, her paragraph reading, and even her spelling were all above a 12th grade level. And some of us would probably say, I don't even have, you know, above a 12th grade spelling level. Um, and, and she really aced everything that had to do with the auditory and the visual circle. But look at her reading comprehension. It's ninth percentile. And if we were to give this a grade level equivalency, it would be somewhere in the elementary school level. Her silent reading comprehension was no different. It was 10th percentile. And sometimes we see students where it's a little bit better when they read silently because they don't have to focus so much on the words, but in this case, that, that was not um, helping her out at all. And her oral directions were ninth percentile. So imagine trying to sit in class and listen to a history lecture about World War II or about Western civilization. She's going to have a lot of difficulty even processing that. Michelle processed parts as she read, so she took in oral language or written language and only got pieces of it. And to give you one more illustration of this, I'm going to give you an example not from Michelle, but from a student I worked with in one of our centers. He was a high school student, and we were doing a paragraph about how after World War II, um, a dentist approached the Army with uh, an idea about training uh, bats to fly into uh, – sorry, I'm, I'm, let me back up. It was not after World War II. It was after Pearl Harbor, after the attack on Pearl Harbor. This dentist approached the Army about training bats to fly into homes in Japan with bomb, bombs strapped on their backs as a way to kind of retaliate for this attack that was – you know, happened in, in Hawaii. And I, so, so we read this whole story, lots of things to picture, you know, Pearl Harbor, World War II, a dentist, the army, bats. And I said to this student who was 16 or 17, tell me, tell me what that story is about so far. Tell me what you're picturing and what you see. And he said, I see a bat. And I said, can you tell me a little bit more? And he said, it's black and it's about this big and it's fuzzy. And so he was only getting pieces of that story. And really, he's probably talking more about a nature story, right, if all he's seeing is a bat. And so imagine how confusing that would be for students to try to be able to process that type of information if all they're getting is fragments or pieces of what they're reading. And so this is going to impact not just recollection of what we read, but the ability to create an image to gestalt or a picture from that story um, will impact our ability to do what are called higher order thinking skills or HOTS. And that's things like 
you know, finding the main idea or the through line in a story, drawing a conclusion, predicting what's going to happen next, evaluating, and especially when we get into literature and poetry, why do we think this character would have thought this or said this or done this? Why was this relevant for the time period? Symptoms of students with weak concept imagery, you can see there's quite a few of them, and some students may um, present with all of these, and some may present with just one or two. We have students with just a mild weakness in concept imagery, and it needs a little bit of development. Uh, weak oral and written language skills. Again, we talked about that problem solving, that critical thinking skills, following directions. Um, you know, a friend of mine just had her, her daughter assessed with us and said that she, you know, when she saw the oral direction score, she said, I thought she just wasn't listening. And really what you're telling me is she's not hearing or processing what I'm saying. And, um, and that was quite a revelation for her, and I think that's a really important thing to understand. Um, expressing language both orally and in writing, and writing is especially complicated because students have to edit their own writing. And so how do you edit what you're trying to say if you're not sure if you said it or not? And so it becomes a really complex process um, that lives in kind of the higher levels of our advanced concept imagery. Grasping humor. Forgive me for my, the cheesy joke I'm about to tell you, but to illustrate this point, I'll tell you a joke that I like to tell my students. And that is, uh, what's worse than finding a worm in your apple? Finding half a worm in your apple. So if you're picturing where the other half is, that's what makes it funny, especially if you're a fourth or fifth grade boy. Um, you think that joke is pretty great. Um, but if you're not picturing that, if you're not visualizing that situation, it's not going to make any sense. And so our students that struggle with concept imagery often love movies or jokes with physical humor because they can see it. Interpreting social situations, cause and effect, Attention and focus, these students are often um, be, you know, seen as struggling with paying attention in class or focusing on a task. Mental mapping, um, this is really important for things like project planning and planning your day or planning time. So some people that have difficulty with temporal reasoning, so being on time to places, sometimes that can be a symptom of concept imagery. Now, if you have a friend or loved one who's late everywhere, don't necessarily accuse them of having a concept imagery weakness, but it can be a symptom. Um, responding to a communicating world and then understanding math concepts. This is a really big one because, you know, if you're visualizing this concept, one-fourth plus one-half, and you were to try to have to explain to me why one of, of, you know, one of those things and one of another thing equals three of something, so three-fourths, you've really got to picture that before you start to explain it, and many of you are probably picturing um, a pie chart um, to, to try to, to think about that and think about how to explain it. So these are kind of the symptoms that our students present with, and so let's talk about who our students actually are. Because as you might imagine, some of our students have a weakness in one of these areas, and sometimes it's very weak or very, um, uh, you know, significant if we think about a Lance or a Michelle, and sometimes it's slight. Sometimes our students need their, their consciousness raised about making gestalt imagery or about their concept imagery so they can apply it to homework and to test taking and things like that. Um, we do see students with weaknesses in both of these areas, you know, both ends of the spectrum, both a Lance and a Michelle. And we see students with varying degrees. So we see students that come to us that really don't have many of these skills intact at all. And we see students that need just a little bit of refinement in both of these areas. And that's how we're able to differentiate our instruction for our students is looking at who they are and what we need to do with them. And that's the first question that we need to ask, right, is who, who is this student and, and what are the skills they come with? We do see students with previous diagnoses. You'll see some listed there, um, some students on the autism spectrum, some students with dyslexia. We also see students with speech and language delay and auditory processing difficulties. And we actually start seeing students at age four and go all the way through adult years. And the oldest student I've heard of us working with was in their 80s. And one of my favorite students uh, we had in one of my centers was 60 years old, and we got to teach him how to read for the first time in his life, which I have to tell you was, was quite the experience. Um, so the way we figure out kind of where our student lands on that spectrum is we do what's called a learning ability evaluation. And this essentially gives us an identification of their strengths and weaknesses. We use a range of standardized language and literacy tests. And so they're nationally normed tests. Um, and we've chosen them because they're helping us isolate the different pieces and parts that we want to look at to give us a whole picture of the student. And we've got tests that represent each of those four circles that I took us through earlier. 
Of course, we do a review of other outside evaluations. So many of our students have already had a speech evaluation. Some have been seen by a clinical or a neuropsychologist. Some have been tested at school or done an evaluation at school. We want to see all of that. Um, we also then look at all of, the, all of that information and we do an analysis. And we sit down with the parents and anyone else that they would like to bring with them. So if you were to come in for an assessment, um, you can bring you know, a grandparent, a teacher, a resource specialist from school, anyone that you feel would be important to be on that team. And we go over the learning profile of the student. And most of the time, it matches exactly what you're seeing. There aren't any surprises. Um, you know, very often there are not. And it just helps us all get on the same page about what our plan is going to be going forward. Um, and then from there, you know, we, t we can move into talking about instruction. The instruction will be based on the student's individual need. And we offer one-on-one -on -one instruction in our centers. So if we think about a student coming to one of our, you know, 50 learning center locations or one of our 40-plus silks, um, our seasonal centers, um, you know, that's where we see students for one-on-one -on -one instruction. Sometimes we are able to see students in groups as well um, if we have a match for them. One of the things I think that's really important to know is the layers of instructional staff that work with our students. So when our students are with us and we're working one-on-one, -on -one, they have one clinician that's assigned to them and who's working with them um, each hour. But in addition to that clinician, or you you know, that's kind of our word for tutor, but we use the word clinician, um, is a consultant. And the consultant is the one who writes the lesson plan, who coordinates with all four of the teachers that student works with, or all two of the teachers that that student works with. They also meet with our parents, and they meet with the center director, and they meet with um, the school. And so they're kind of the instruction coordinator. In addition to the consultants, so we've got clinicians, consultants, we have the center directors that oversee that instruction. And then we also have an instruction department. So you see there it's, it mentions our director of instruction. She can, she and her team, I should say, if we have a need for them to see one of our students, they log on to a web-based system and they can actually watch a session live and they can give us direct feedback. And I can't tell you how invaluable that is for us in terms of the quality of instruction that we're delivering with our students and, again, getting everybody on the same page. Um, many times right after that meeting happens, we're getting on the phone, we're talking about what we need to change or tweak or keep doing um, to make sure that student's getting the most effective instruction that they can get. Video conferencing, I mentioned that. And then we do standardized instructional development workshops for all of our staff. So anyone who, who makes the cut in terms of being a clinician with us um, actually goes into a workshop where we train all of our staff at the same time um, together um, using our video conference equipment with a local trainer. And so our instruction and our quality is standardized. And we do this not just for our clinicians, but you know, last week myself and the other regional directors were involved in a training, a more advanced training for some of our consultants. Um, and it's, it's a really great way to respond to the needs of our staff and our students right away. And it also allows for all of us to be meeting today. Some more notes on instruction. It is daily. Um, and this, I think, can be one of the toughest parts to figure out for our families, is the daily instruction. And what we mean by that is Monday through Friday, um, you know, so it's five days a week. And I think the thing that we have to think about when we think about daily instruction is if we're looking at a Lance or a Michelle or a student who is a Lance and Michelle maybe in first grade, and we kind of know what that trajectory is going to look like, if we're going to change that, it can't just be a couple of days a week. It has to be on a regular training schedule, um, you know, on a regular instructional schedule. And we need that opportunity to get in there and, and develop new habits in their brain every day. And so that's a really important part of why we're so successful with our students. So we see them five days a week, anywhere from one to six sessions a day. So our little guys, our four- and five-year-olds, they oftentimes do an hour. Um, a day. Some of our older students, you know, um, my 60-year-old student that I mentioned, he was there four hours a day. Um, and so that will vary depending on the student. They will have a different clinician every hour, so it gives them some variety within their day, but we keep those same clinicians. So they'll come in at 8 and have the same clinician, and they'll have the same clinician their second hour at 9 o'clock. And it allows for them to have daily variety, which keeps them engaged and on task, but it also allows for them to have um, kind of uh, weekly consistency and week-by-week -week consistency. They do get a break. Um, some of you may already be asking yourselves, oh my goodness, how are they going to do, you know, two or four hours? They do get a break between each session. And I think the other thing to note is they get a variety of tasks. 
So the tasks change every five to 15 minutes depending on the age of the student and what they're working on. And it's not as though there's a teacher speaking to a whole class saying, okay, everybody, open to page five and work on that for the next 10 or 15 minutes and I'll come back to you or I'll circulate around. Our students get direct feedback for every single word they read or every detail of a picture they give. And so it's very engaging. Um, and you'll see there it says recognition tools and incentive plans. We have ways to recognize our students staying on task in session. Um, you know, one of the things I love that we do is we have these little cards that are called magical learning moment cards. And when they read a tough word or they move up a level, we write down whatever that accomplishment is and they get to go put it in a box. And once a week we have a drawing from that box and they can win prizes and we read the cards out loud so they're recognized in front of the other students and staff and clinicians that are in the center. Something else I love that we do is we do um, what we call um, milestone parties for our students. And so this is where, um, let's say we have a first grader who's ready to read their first chapter book. We have a party for them and we let them invite their friends and family. I've had neighbors, I've had cousins, I've had you know parents, best friends come and work with our students, uh, sorry, and watch the student get to read a book. And then we do a celebration um, and often there's treats and things like that. So it's a great time for the family and the center to come together and celebrate that student. And there's, there's other things that we put into place as well. I talked about this a little bit earlier, but just to reiterate, the clinicians are the ones delivering the, the instruction, and, and that instruction is supervised by the consultants and the instructional support team. So consultants are on the ground in centers, instructional support team are virtually supporting us from the different locations that they're in. Something I didn't hit on is this idea of progress updates. So our parents come in um, about every 20 hours of instruction. So sometimes that's weekly, sometimes that's every other week, and you're actually watching what's happening in session. So you're sitting in that session, sometimes you're participating, sometimes you're observing, and then you sit down with the consultant and we go over what we've been working on the week before and, um, and what, the next, what the plan is for the next week, and then we send you home with a written summary. The other thing that we do for our families is parent practice sessions. And so this is where we'll either train you individually or we'll train you in a small group. Uh, to, to learn how to reinforce these skills at home. And we don't train you in the whole program, we don't show you how to do the whole thing, we don't want to overwhelm you, but we're going to give you some key things to reinforce at home as you're working with your child either on homework or driving in the car. You might ask them questions about what they're visualizing or what they're picturing, again, to get that imagery going. And parents love these. I've got a number of centers uh, in my region that do these in small group sessions. And essentially what happens is, uh, you know, parents come together and we show you the steps and you get to practice with one another. One of my center directors was telling me that she had parents this last summer, she had a couple that came first thing in the morning at eight o'clock and then they came again for the one o'clock parent practice session. And she said, oh, guys, it's, it's gonna be the same information. And they said, we know, we wanna hear it again <laughs> because they wanted to make sure that they had that down knowing they were gonna be working with their student at home. Once we kind of move all the way through instruction, students have been with us daily, you've been getting progress updates, they've been getting recognized for their great work, their skills are improving, then at the end of that recommended instruction time, we do a retest. And the goal of this is to help us understand what are they able to do independently. And we use this in conjunction with what we've seen in session and what you're seeing at home to make recommendations for the next steps. And during the school year, for example, some of our students finish their, their, their course of instruction and they're ready for follow-up. So they come in with their schoolwork and we're helping them apply um, what they've learned to schoolwork. Uh, we, we will definitely ask you um, or insist or um, you know, invite ourselves to come to your school visit because we want to have a team approach to what's happening with your son or daughter or if you're a teacher with the students that you're seeing that come to our centers. Um, you know, we wanna make sure that we're all working together and if you're seeing something when they're back in the classroom that they're not applying these skills, we need to know that if we're doing follow-up in the center. So there's a really important component there to make sure that everyone's on the same page and we love visiting schools and sharing with, with the teachers of our students what we've been focusing on. And then you'll see there it says annual reassessment and we're in the season right now where we're doing that with our students. Uh, we invite all of our students to come back for an updated evaluation to see how they're, they're doing on their skills and I have to tell you it's probably one of the favorite times of years for, of the year for all of us because our students that we haven't seen in six months or a year or two years are now coming back in and they're taller and they're more confident and, um, and they're excited to brag to us about their skills. Sometimes 
sometimes they'll bring their uh, their report cards or you know different successes that they've had, and, and if they'll let us, we put them up on the board in the center. So, some of you may have heard of the names of some of our programs. Um, and I want to give you a quick overview and just a place to put these if you have heard of the names or if you've looked on our website. These first two programs of Seeing Stars and LIPS, these both address the issues of phonemic uh, awareness. And then the Seeing Stars program also addresses symbol imagery. And so Seeing Stars essentially teaches students to visualize a letter for every sound that they hear. So I might say to the student, I might show them a card with a B on it, and we talk about what it says. It says B, and then I take that card away and I have them write it in the air. But, and they trace that, that, that letter, they visualize it in their mind, and then they say the sound. So we're trying to get a symbol to sound or a sound symbol association for that. So we're starting that phonics process, but we're reinforcing it with, um, we're reinforcing it with imagery. And this is important, again, to get that muscle going, to get that development starting to happen there. And then, as you might imagine, we just increase the volume and the complexity of the words. So we go to words with not just a consonant, but a consonant and a vowel. And then we go to words with three sounds, and then four sounds, and five. And if it's appropriate for the age of the student, we get into multisyllable words and complex multisyllable words with multiple you know, beginnings and endings. The LIPS program also addresses uh, phonemic awareness, but this does it in a way that taps into the student's kinesthetic or articulatory feedback. And so for that buh sound, the first thing we do is have the student make that sound, buh. And we talk about which part of your mouth do you feel working and what do you feel it doing? And so we're trying to get them to establish kind of a movement that their mouth is making and so that they can access that kind of baseline pool of resources. They always have their mouth with them and they can always check to see what it's doing. As you might imagine, not all of our students need that baseline or that root level of, of sensory input. They don't necessarily need to feel what their mouth is doing, so not all of our students that struggle in phonemic awareness and symbol imagery need to do lips, but we have it available as this incredible resource um, to get students going in their skills. Shifting to the other side of the brain and thinking about concept imagery as the visualizing and verbalizing program, this, again, step-by-step step teaches students how to visualize, but now we're teaching them how to visualize concepts. So we ask them to picture a word. So I want you to visualize an elephant, and probably a lot of you had an elephant just pop into your mind and you're picturing it. And we ask the student different details like background and size and color. And then we move on and say, now I want you to picture the elephant rumbled across the plains um, as it chased, um, I guess elephants don't chase, as it ran away from, from a jeep. <laughs> um, and, and that allows you to have more language and more input to picture this idea. And, and then from there we go from a sentence to a few sentences to a paragraph, and we're increasing how abstract the material is as well. And so at some point for our high school students, we might be working on application to writing a paper or application to test taking. We've even had high school students work on, um, you know, I had one student that wanted to apply these skills to his football playbook because he was always confused about what the coach was asking him to do. And the really fun part is after he went through that big training week at the end of the summer, um, he he was one of the best players in terms of following the, the, the playbook, and he was actually starting where his, he had, that hadn't been his experience in the past. The Talkies program um, is one where a lot of, in the past we've had students where they came to us and we knew they needed VV, but they didn't have some language skills in place that would allow them to access the basic steps of the VV program. And so Talkies was created by Nancy Bell and someone named Christy Benetti, and it allows for us to teach students some of the basic um, piecing together of sentence structure. So we ask them to start by, by looking at an object and naming it, and then we start using descriptive words, and then we take the object away and ask them to picture it. So we're working um, some basic verbalization and some basic imagery skills, and then from there, students move into the VV program. And, and I've seen students go from being virtually nonverbal in their sentence, um, you know, in their explanation of ideas, to speaking in, in a complete sentence. It's a really exciting program for us. And then on Cloud 9 is actually our math program, and it's an integration of both seeing stars, or some of the concepts, I should say, from seeing stars and from visualizing and verbalizing. Because in order to do math, you have to have good symbol imagery. You have to be able, and in this case, it's numeral imagery. You have to be able to picture a pattern of numbers. So if I said 3 times 3 equals, you're picturing a 9 after that. But you can't hold your math facts long term if your numeral imagery or your symbol imagery is weak. And then again, we talked about that example of fractions. If you're not visualizing the concept, 
concept, it's going to be really hard to approach math and understand it. You're just going to learn it by rote. And a lot of our parents describe that. So when students approach the cumulative test, they're not sure how to do the different problems because they're used to doing the same problem on their homework over and over and over again. And then when the problems are mixed up and it asks them to, to actually assess the different equations and which strategy to use, they get, they get really confused. I want to say thank you very much for attending today and for your time um, and for, for coming and listening. I, I really hope that you've gotten a better insight about how your students are learning and what some of the potential options can be for solutions. Welcome back and thank you for all the great questions we received during the webinar. One of the questions we received the most often was, how can I sign up for a learning ability evaluation? Well, fortunately, we're actually going to be in Puerto Rico from February 9th to February 13th, providing these evaluations that Kendall spoke about earlier. We'll also be providing consultations in English and Spanish during this time. Another question we were asked is, how can we help? And really what we're looking for are ambassadors. We want to be in your community, and so we need your help. This can be anything from handing out flyers, filling, out, filling seats and overviews, or just spreading the word of mouth that we'll be there March 30th. Another great thing that you can do is go ahead and reach out to us by phone or email if you have any more questions or would like to sign up for an evaluation. The best number to reach us at is 888-414-1739, or you can shoot us an email at puertorico.info at lindamubell.com.